Each year at the Ethical Society, <clears throat> we organize our programs around a theme. Our theme this year is building an ethical future. And in January, we are exploring the future of money. Today, we have guest speaker Beth Neff. Beth Neff is an organic farmer, urban planner, sustainability activist, writer, parent, and cooperative organizer. Her current project is Marsh, a not-for-profit organized as a cooperative laboratory for the practical investigation of relational forms of social, economic, ecological, and cultural composition. Marsh combines urban farming, a sliding scale grocery store, a sustainable commercial kitchen, and public space in order to cultivate tactics and strategies for resilience and biocultural transformation. Beth, would you like to come up? Morning, thank you for having me. So this discussion this morning is based on the assumption that capitalism cannot be ethical. I am arguing that capitalism, it doesn't matter if we practice it differently. It doesn't matter if we make small changes. Um, we can't blame those who are greedy and corrupt the system for the implicit, inherently unethical aspects of capitalism. I'm going to discuss this issue in three parts. Uh, we'll talk about what capitalism is what it does, um, talk about the implications of what capitalism is, and then possible alternatives. So we will start with the uh, practices. How does capitalism work? Um, I'm not an economist. You don't need to be. Uh, people have been critiquing capitalism for nearly 200 years now. A uh, little example, our friend Karl Marx, obviously, our original critique. Uh, Emma Goldman, Walter Benjamin, uh, Jason Hickel is a modern day climate activist um, with some um, good pointed critiques of capitalism. CLR James talked about capitalism um, or uh, coined the term racial capitalism, um, probably familiar with Howard Zinn who gives us historical context for the implications of capitalism. So what does capitalism do? How does it act? Well, number one, capitalism creates profit. So we understand how profit works. Import, inputs are resources and labor. The output is money in the pockets of the owners of the means of production, as Marx identified. Clearly, for this to work, any cost of resource extraction has to be minimized either by passing that cost off to others, um, potentially to a later generation, or externalizing the cost from the equation. Um, it can be a, ta a loss, it can be a tax deduction, or just devaluing the impact. The same is true of labor costs, of course. Pay, labor, pay workers as little as possible, um, externalize or essentially outsource any of the costs of human labor which we understand to be health care, child care, housing, food. Those are all externalized from the equation of capitalism in order to ensure the largest possible gap between costs and price, which is profit. Okay. Um, second, capitalism promotes competition um, or is based on the concept of competition. So there are quite a number of trajectories that we could follow, historical progressions to um, describe the fundamental concept, how we got to the idea that capitalism needs to be competition. Um, it's not a coincidence that the, any trajectory we follow, we're going to see it as being parallel to the ones that our nation's founders followed in order to arrive at the, co at the concepts of democracy. Um, these two things, um, went hand in hand historically, um, and one of the reasons that we have a tendency to conflate the two when they are clearly not the same. Um, 
So I'm gonna try to make this part brief, but it is kind of helpful to have a little bit of an underpinning. Um, you could choose a lot of different historical pathways. Um, so I chose the pathway from Thomas Hobbes to James Locke to Adam Smith. So this is a simplified version of this narrative. So first we have Hobbes. Um, he tells us that nature equals disorder. Human nature then is really disordered. Uh, it's untrustworthy, it's um, not reliable, but it is controllable. And the way that we can control this disordered human nature is through financial incentives. So next comes Locke. And Locke likes Hobbes, he thinks he's got the right idea. And he's gonna add to that, that we also have inalienable rights. He, of course, believes those rights are God-given and that they are preserved through the social contract. So you can kind of see this parallel with people who are framing a, a new form of government going along with this idea of a new form of economics. So we've got these inalienable or God-given rights. They're preserved through the social contract. And what arena do they thrive in? That of financial affairs. So the way to preserve this social contract, according to Locke, then is to preserve the right to own property. And so property then becomes the foundation of, of capitalist competition. It also confirms the, the role of nature, which is only valued in this estimation by its transformation via labor in a way that benefits society. So nature has no intrinsic value of its own. It is only when it is transformed for human use that it becomes valuable. Then finally, Adam Smith takes this one step further with his ideas about conformity. So he's using the word conformity to describe what he calls the self-interest incentive. And he believes that self-interest is the driving force of the social order. So keep that term order in mind because that's the thing we're trying to preserve. The understanding then is that the desire for personal advantage is the basis upon which economic systems should be constructed. Not just that they are, but that they should be. And thus competition is what will lead to prosperity and social benefit. And this is achieved through the invisible hand. So we'll get back to the invisible hand. Um, but basically the idea is that if everyone is working for themselves, through this uh, mechanism of the invisible hand, the best for everyone will occur. Thus, the market is what's natural, and it is an absolute good force in human affairs because humans are naturally competitive and will work towards prosperity for themselves, which will result in prosperity for all. So that brings us to the third characteristic of capitalism, which I'll call the bad faith principle. So winners take all. Winners deserve to win. In other words, if you're not collecting wealth, it's because you aren't following the rules or you just aren't good enough. This justification for allowing capital to amass in fewer and fewer hands suggests that workers would not be able to effectively manage any aspects of the workplace or of society unless they have proved themselves adept at reaping the benefits of the system. You can see why in this universe of capitalist competition, there is no room for the concept of systemic inequity because it flies directly in the face of the market as a natural force for good. Finally, capitalism relies on the intrinsic value of growth. So growth equals the accumulation of um, capital. So the success of capitalism relies on the ongoing and ever increasing accumulation of wealth, goods, and we'll see in a moment, political power. The argument goes, if market-driven profit and competition are good for us, then they must be good for everyone, which is the perfect justification for globalized corporate control over not just economies, but governance as well. 
from that contention, we can, I think we're, don't move. <laughs> we can conclude that if profit can be made on a local, national scale, it's even more profitable then to apply capitalist principles to everyone, to the international scale, along with what that provides us, which is unmitigated access to those ever important resources, regardless of local or national sovereignty. Most importantly, the result of this devotion to and belief in the near divine qualities of the market allowed economists to successfully advocate for measuring economic activity with growth metrics such as the gross domestic product, or GDP, which measures the final cost of goods and services without any attention to the economic, social, or environmental cost of production, or the impact of increasing production on well-being or quality of life. So when we read, is capitalism successful, if we use metrics that only measure the thing we want to know, then we're obviously going to only find out the thing that we want to know and ignore all of the rest. So through this brief analysis of the things that capitalism does, the way it acts or behaves, we can see that the values that underpin capitalism are deserving of somewhat of an emerging ethical critique. The circular argument protects capitalism from dissent, but it rests on an invented argument. It rests on the idea of the invisible hand and ignores the implications. So let's talk about those implications a little bit. Profit is by design extractive. It can work in two ways. You can increase the gap between the cost of goods and the price, or you can increase the amount of cost of good, uh, the amount of goods sold. Either way, resources have to increase at the expense of the ecosystems from which they derive. There, there's no other way about it. You have to continue to extract in order to create profit. Costs that are generated by that extraction then have to be externalized from the system or the equation. The cost then is levied on ecosystems, geographies, locations that have no measurable value within this system, can't speak for themselves, and have no legal defense right now. People are working on that. Thus the planet, poor people, future generations, pay for the extraction of resources with things like climate change, species extinction, pollution, ecosystem destruction, biosphere collapse, and massive quantities of waste from consumer goods produced for profit rather than need. Secondly, competition is by design exploitive. It is no accident at all that our view of the natural world was for generations framed around what we were led to believe were the competitive relationships within species and individuals within a species. So survival of the fittest. That's not what Darwin meant, but that's the way we've interpreted it. Dog eat dog world, all of that. But it's not true. We now understand that this description of nature's dynamics is completely false that mutual benefit is by far a more accurate rule, should there be one, of nature, and that survival depends on webs of interactive features and actors within a complex system where all have the best opportunity to thrive. So the competition model, this is the way nature behaves, is, is simply inaccurate. Labor then, especially when viewed as a commodity within this profit-motivated system, rather than as actors within this complex web of mutual well-being, cannot possibly be anything but exploited when we're defining the system by property ownership and the success of that system is measured by the lack of wealth, ownership, and agency of the labor force. So this equation could just as easily read productivity, efficiency, Competitive edge, profit, equals less money, less self-management, less time, less sovereignty, less agency, less leisure for the worker. That's how we define exploitive. Third, bad faith is by design racist, classist, white supremacist, nationalist, inequitable. 
it is much easier to exploit workers if you can argue that they are less human, less worthy, less viable, less competent, threat to the social order, remember that one, et cetera. We have so many examples of how this concept has been expressed in practice. Genocide, subjugation of indigenous populations, slavery, colonialism and military imperialism, Jim Crow, racist property laws, redlining, rampant industrialization, the drug war, modern day immigration policy. Once policies or public opinions that push this supremacist agenda are in place, wealth rapidly becomes concentrated in fewer and fewer hands who accumulate greater and greater power over public policy and opinion. In this way, bad faith illustrates most accurately how capitalism not only intri is intrinsically unethical, but is antithetical to democracy in that it establishes, promotes, and exacerbates unequal access to not just wealth, but power. Fourth. Uh, we missed one, I think. Oh, no, we didn't. We did, for, okay. Thank you. Growth is by design unstable. We're led to believe that it's the opposite, but we have seen throughout all of economic history the destabilizing effects of greed and expansion on the general well-being of the populace, resulting in more and more inequity. A few examples, exploration and chartered trade era. So ships go across the ocean, they take whatever they want, and the people that are left behind, their entire cultures are destabilized. Uh, the enclosure movement in Europe, beginning in the 16th century, property owners can now put fences around their property. Um, people now can't hunt, you know, they can't farm. Um, they're basically left out of any means of survival, um, and obviously those economies are severely destabilized. The Industrial Revolution, first example we have of very direct exploitation of workers and labor. Great Depression, major destabilizing event, uh, subprime mortgage crisis of 2008, and numerous inflationary and recessionary booms and bust cycles. So we now understand that capitalism as an economic system is extremely unstable, and even though the growth concept was based on supply and demand, and we were led to believe that this was a formula that was going to be a stabilizing economic force, we now know that it's, it's exactly the opposite, um, which became very obvious, later, obvious during the pandemic when reliable supplies of resources to feed this industrial or retail machine um, basically became a fantasy. In fact, to remain stable, Capitalist growth requires that no one learns that they are being exploited, or at least acts on it, which is one major reason that union organizing is such a threat, and that resource extraction is mostly out of sight and out of mind, which becomes increasingly more and more difficult with things like leaking pipelines, dangerously poor air quality, state-sized trash islands in the ocean, and the digital media to document them. In the desperation to continue growing and exploiting, we are seeing and will continue to see more draconian strategies and policies that demonize historical accuracy, climate action, labor sovereignty, non-compliance with gender norms, exert control over bodies, particularly women and minorities, and employ surveillance technologies, marketing pressure to consume, and authoritarian power structures that seek to preserve the status quo. So now we're on to potential solutions. These are the reasons that Marsh has formed as post, anti, non, capitalist, enterprise, whichever you prefer. Specifically, um, our stated purpose is to design and explore emergent models of human-scaled generative social practices. So a direct, um, destabilization of the concepts, concepts of profit, competition, bad faith, and growth. We achieve this purpose um, through these things, creative artistic projects, performances, exhibitions, collaborations, community engagement, reciprocal education, 
generative process. So the ba basically the idea is that we are looking for the specific substitutes that will address these, the negative implications of a capitalist system. Right now, Marsh's physical presence in the community consists of a cooperative gro sliding scale grocery store, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, network of neighborhood urban plots, a licensed kitchen, a diner gathering space, and then um, three slides for outdoor gathering spaces. So our conceptual framework seeks to ground social change in these spaces through values of cooperation, group dynamics, grassroots, democratic decision-making, broad boundary resisting participation, and ongoing testing of relational, ethical, ecological, and justice-based economic models. So here are some of the ways that these principles are enacted. The grocery store is a curated selection of natural, organic, and ecological products that are designed to improve quality of life. Um, so we mean curated, every product has to have a reason for being there. Um, it has to somehow um, enhance individual health. It has to improve on the environmental impact of our consumption um, or do something for the community. Um, we don't sell just random consumer products. Um, we try to focus on things that are required for sustenance. And um, we grow the majority of the in-season produce uh, right there in the neighborhood. And we do no paid advertising or promotions for products, so we do have an active social media presence. Um, basically, we are seeking to focus on products and practices that reduce negative impact on people and environment. If we have something and nobody wants it, we just don't have it anymore. Um, we're not like the you know General Mills section of the grocery store where those products are there every single time, no matter what. And they come and take them out and then they put them back in again. If something doesn't sell, we just don't have it. Um, in addition, okay, back, back, back. Um, okay, next one, sorry. Next, there we go. In addition, uh, we pursue a no waste practice, uh, which means that any products that can't be sold directly, which is you know like flawed produce, um, dairy approaching its sell by date, um, those things are all transformed in our kitchen into high quality baked goods and prepared foods that are then available in the grocery store. So this also means that we're eliminating or reducing packaging um, or using only that which is reusable, recyclable, or compostable. Um, and we have an extensive bulk section for grains, flowers, beans, dried fruits, nuts, herbs, and spices. Encourages patrons to use their own containers or to use the recycled ones that we provide. Um, and it also promotes eating foods uh, lower on the food chain. Um, limited processing, um, you know, requires our input in order to create food instead of being pre-made and pre-packaged. Um, next, we operate as a nonprofit, but we are also taking that one step further in incorporating a sliding scale model. Um, so this means that patrons can determine um, what costs their own budgets can absorb or make a contribution to the group well-being by paying a little bit more. So each product is marked with a cost to us, and then the patrons are given the option of paying at cost, adding a percentage, we suggest 10 or 20 percent, or paying as much as 20 percent less. Um, we don't ask for any proof of family finances. Um, we don't restrict which products um, can be purchased. Um, we often throw in extras if patrons come up a little bit short. Um, simply, we operate in good faith with the idea that anyone, regardless of means or circumstances, deserves quality food and is welcome in the Marsh community. Um, this is one of the critical reasons then behind Marsh's organization as a multi-stakeholder cooperative. So a cooperative just basically means that the membership owns the means of productions instead of a single owner or corporation, and operations are determined by the principle of mutual benefit. 
while anyone can purchase groceries at the co-op, uh, we do offer the option to pay a one-time membership fee or to earn membership through patronage, which means shopping at the store 10 times. Uh, members have access to an online catalog or where they can order anything that we can order. Um, they vote in elections, serve as board members, make proposals for use of the space. Um, many members also do volunteer, though that's not a requirement as it is in some uh, cooperatives. And we um, are all constantly looking for ways to involve members more, and we'll be doing so um, quite deeply in the coming year as we're launching a climate resilience initiative. Uh, paid labor then is organized as a workers cooperative in which all team members are paid equal wages, um, divide extra resources, share responsibilities, and participate in democratic decision making. Uh, the third component of like a producer's co-op um, is kind of um, working in the kitchen, but it's sort of more aspirational at this point. Um, we would like to develop a, like a community-wide um, agricultural producers cooperative. Um, that's not happening, but right now we're growing the majority of seasonal produce um, for the kitchen and grocery ourselves, but would like to expand. So, expansion. What does that mean in the context um, if we're operating in a no-growth model? And I just wanted to kind of throw this in. I think that the best explanation for what growth means in a post-capitalist society um, comes from this idea of donut economics. Um, Kate Rayworth is the economist that has proposed this, um, and we hope this will sweep the world with its good sense. So donut economics argues that climate breakdown is obviously, a clarion call for a new type of economic accounting that does not rely on the GDP or promote extraction, exploitation, or bad faith. So what she is saying is that a fair, equitable, and ecological responsible society resides instead in this sweet spot, the, the light green area between solid and fair social foundations and the environmental ceiling. So wealthy countries presently far exceed the ceiling while many of their citizens are also falling below this social foundation and poorer countries are struggling to reach the lowest limits of the social foundation while all often suffering the consequences of the global capitalist economy. So in this scenario, fair systems need to grow in order to meet basic demands and to replace those that are exacerbating precarity. We have absolutely no need to earn a profit or to be in competition with other enterprises, but we do aspire to eventually seed similar products th projects throughout the city, um, imagining cooperative mutual benefit organizing as part of a community culture. Um, in the meantime, this is not South Broadway, <laughs> but maybe how we envision it might look someday. Um, in the meantime, though, we do need to thrive in our own environment and explore these early stages of non-capitalistic practices and have conversations like the one here today, where we share thoughts, invite participation, and receive feedback. So I'm grateful for your time and attention. Check, check, check. Hey, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and start our Q&A here in a moment. Uh -uh. To keep it on schedule. I grab my phone from the desk back there to check with any questions we may have from Alter. Usually just up front here would be okay. fine. It's pretty casual. No need to go all the way back up on this stage. I'm going to hand you this. You'll hear me from the beyond. I'm going to grab my phone and start with a question from Alter. 
I feel super fancy with my wireless microphone. Me too. Stream is intact. Yes, we're good to go. First question we have from Alter. In many ways, we are structurally embedded in capitalism living in the United States and increasingly anywhere in the world. But how do individuals resist capitalism while currently depending on it to survive? You address some of these things, but that's the question I thought we'd start with. I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I mean, we. I don't think this is necessary. Can I? Oh. Can you hear me? Well, for the people on the stream. Oh, I see. Yeah, this one may not be on. Check, check. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That one's better. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Right. Um, so, yeah, this is, a, this is a big question, and it is true that we are embedded in capitalism, and as I was just discussing with someone, um, what often seems to happen as we try to form new um, structures is that the people who are forming the new structures just end up being exploited. You know, if, if we're, if we're going to try to, you know, grow food on a local level, we're going to try to bypass, you know, what we know to be an extractive and exploitive food system, then we just end up working 17 hours a day and being outside when it's 106. And, you know, so I think that the, for me, the number one way is for us to learn how to work in community. I think this is the kind of thing that probably resonates with the people that are here. Um, what, so when we talk about mutual benefit, it's, it's, it, Okay, I'll say that it's two-sided. One is that it is working within principles. So imagining what our substitute principles would be and then critiquing you know, our actions, our communication, the things we think about, the things we read, the things we do based on a, a, a principles of, uh, of <laughs> a critique of our principles. So that was the reason I kind of approached talking about capitalism today is, you know, like what it does, how it behaves, um, because it does create a sense of principles then that we just take for granted and become like, you know, metabolized. Um, that we just assume that these are the things that, that are and the way they have to be. And so I think it's a matter of just, so what would be a different kind of a principle? And so we throw mutual benefit out there, you know, sort of this big basket that we can throw a lot of things into and that works kind of as a principle, you know, what we can check against, and then imagining ways that we're not in competition with each other, you know, our, our sense of, of limitation, um, you know, our sense of property ownership, the way we live in our houses, the way we live in our communities, the way we do our shopping, our buying, our consuming, um, all of those things, um, I, I don't want to sound like a conspiracist, but those things are designed to separate us from each other. Um, and so each time we can imagine a way that we can be joined together in the way that we, you know, consume, the way that we interact, um, then that, you know, takes a, just a little chink out of the power of capitalism. Um, and that's, we, that's the reason that our next year is devoted to um, the idea of, do, of doing like a climate symposium. Um, what we hope will happen then is that a number of things. One, that people will become involved in addressing an issue that feels like it's completely out of our control. So we will see that there are things, small things and large things that we can do as a group to address this existential issue. Um, two, we can create gatherings of people that either usually don't have a lot of agency and usually are not sitting in rooms together. Um, so we live in a neighborhood um, that is, you know, weirdly enough, one of the most integrated neighborhoods in the city of St. Louis um, because it's a low income neighborhood. And so there's all kinds of low income people. Um, and so the, these, this is a community that has never been asked to participate in problem solving, or if they are, it is through vehicles that that are that don't feel accessible. So one of our principles is to imagine what an invitation looks like if it is something that is responded to. Um, so I think that that's the other, you know, another part of it. Principles, creating an invitation um, to participate, and then creating as many opportunities as possible for groups of people to gather in all kinds of different configurations and to imagine that they, and to have the outcome of what they do as a group be something that's based on the, the um, 
to say skills, that sounds so capitalistic, <laughs> but it, um, the, the character of the people involved. So when we talk about a climate symposium, then, you know, people start checking off, like, okay, you got to talk about environment, you got to talk about housing, got to talk about transportation. Well, yeah, sure, we want to talk about all those things, but what we mostly want to talk about is what means the most to the people who end up being in the room when we're having that conversation, focusing on the things that they're most interested in, finding people that they can work with to do the research, ask the questions, you know, who, who do we need to hear from, and then creating sort of a presentation for a larger community that will ba be based on their create their creativity you know maybe they want to write a story or maybe they want to build a diorama or maybe they want to do a performance or maybe they want to take a, a, a neighborhood tour you know what whatever's most creative so that we break down this I'm sorry standing in front of a group of people <laughs> and talking to them in this way uh, so you know, all of those kinds of things. And, and it, it's just a constant critique. And, you know, do we want to live in constant judgment of our actions and our neighbors? Doesn't feel that great, but, you know, climate disaster doesn't feel super great either. So. We are in Carondelet. Yeah, so far, we, uh, we call it the deep south yeah. St. Louis. <laughs> so, uh, yes, right. There's Quite, one more further yeah. south from us, but. Yeah. A question in the space? For the so Beth, what societies around the world do you think would be uh, ideal compared to for people to live in uh, compared to the one in the U.S. and the rest of the West? I guess. Um, so there are many implications of um, location right now. Um, I, so I'll, I'll tell this from a personal, I, I'm active on Twitter, not, I never post, <laughs> I never speak, but I follow a lot of like climate scientists and people who are working in the political realm um, because I'm really interested to know what's going on and it's kind of a, like a mind boggling resource for just what people are saying, what people are doing. And definitely there are individual countries on every continent that are doing well at responding to uh, climate change. Um, I, I'm kind of, like I understand geography, but I'm kind of bad at like remembering the names of countries. I know that there's a country in Southeast Asia that has created like a happiness index that is a replacement for uh, gross domestic product or gross national product. So another way of sort of measuring for economics. Um, I just saw, I think it's in Amsterdam, they're building a giant parking garage for bikes. So it's underground, you know, you may have seen this, it's all over social media. Um, so there's a lot of examples of people doing good things in sort of selective ways. Um, I think that there are systems within the EU, because this, these are privileged countries that have money, that are moving more quickly in the direction of, um, you know, carbon-free societies. Um, so that's good. Um, it's a very complicated issue to talk about what northern and western countries are doing to lower their consumption and their carbon emissions when they the impact they have made on the earth can never be mitigated. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's absolutely mind boggling to see the difference between, you know, what households in, sorry, I don't want to just like randomly pick a country, but usually in the Southern hemisphere, you know, people's carbon output is minute compared to just any average American household. So who's doing well? Well, the people who never did bad in the first place, but, but the whole idea of this like donut economics is to figure out what growth can look like so that you know they're 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 in the hole of the donut <laughs> people who never made it into having basic social and economic needs being met and how the distribution of resources can happen in such a way so that they get to lift their way into the donut and we stop exceeding the capacity of the donut. So I, I like that image. I'm sure there's all kinds of other like degrowth imagery that works. So that's one that just happens to work in, in my head. 
Yeah, I like the donut. Yeah. Uh, I like all donuts. I like the donuts. Yeah, I like any donuts. Somebody else, a question in the space? I just want to be inclusive. I'm trying to work that. Yes, thank you so much for being so patient while I look the other way. It's okay. Um, you didn't uh, come out and say it per se, but I, I sense that uh, the message is we, we don't want pure capitalism, but we don't want pure socialism either. We want an effective blending of the two that would keep things running and also take care of uh, people on the lower end of the economic scale. Um, At least that's... Okay, so I, I'm gonna be argumentative here. Okay. All right, so um, this talk today was designed to make you believe there is nothing useful in capitalism. <laughs> So, the, it, it, I, I'm not that I'm not an all-or-nothing kind of person. I think, though, that as long as we continue to search for ways to tweak or find value in capitalism, we're we're not going to understand the damage that it's doing. So, I also think that it's incredibly complicated and a problem that maybe that I would need more conversation about from people who know far more than I do, but the ways in which we have conflated these economic systems with our political systems. So we know those things can be divided. There's all kinds of authoritarian capitalist countries in this world, and we are becoming one. So right now, we are a semi-fascist capitalist country. The absolute worst possible combination. So socialism, has been conflated then with places that have authoritarian governments, but operates completely differently when it is in a social democracy. So the, as long as we continue to confuse and conflate political systems with economic systems, which we can't possibly not do, because as we saw through history, they were conflated from day one, and the fact that power the, the power within the system comes from wealth so whenever you're going to talk about an economic system you can't not talk about the political system yes i, I thought Just, maybe you had something to say about that so I, I i don't guess i have more to say i'm not looking at a specific system i definitely i don't i'm not afraid of socialism i, I don't see that as being a, a dangerous thing in any way at all and most people would define socialism as a system that is oriented towards distribution of wealth and mutual benefit. I can't see anything wrong with that. Has it been practiced well? Probably not. Like, who does things good? Like, you know, it, it, people in power always are gonna do things f for themselves, or that's kind of, I'm starting to sound like Hobbes. But um, I, I think that w we would, the countries that we see doing the best, <laughs> to go back to this question, um, are definitely the, the Scandinavian countries that are social democracies. They're, they're working to get as far away from capitalism as they possibly can. So I, uh, a, a couple of things. I think I take issue with the notion that the United States is a capitalist country because we do see the government put a lot of its thumb on the scales of winners and losers in industry like you spoke with the subprime mortgage crisis, they were deciding which banks would succeed and which ones would fail, which certainly actually, when you compare what happened with the Great Depression, it was probably better for preserving the existing system, but nonetheless it happened and we have you know, government subsidies, government making a lot of determinations in the way the economy moves. So I'm not really sure that it's fair to criticize capitalism as a system on the basis of what the United States is doing. And then further to say that there's nothing good in capitalism, I actually fundamentally disagree with that. There's a lot of efficiencies that we receive through our sort of, it is, it is unfortunate that it does roll up to a winner-take-all system. And so, it, so pure capitalism does, does limit itself in that way. And in some ways you do have to uh, necessarily worry about the uh, likelihood of an overthrow from below. So if you, if, you, if you keep people repressed enough, then the system breaks down. So you, you, you want people to have enough equal rights that they still feel like they're bought into the system, 
so that there's not a violent overthrow or else you don't have a successful government. But like we can't all work, we can't possibly sustain our existing society on a series of cooperative farms. Like we are not, it's, it, we have been able to transition from most people in the country being subsistence farmers in the 1800s into a technology-based economy now because we because of the uh, of the efficiencies of capitalism, and I feel like if we're saying we're going to all go to, go roll back to eating eating you know satisfying our our collective survival needs marsh style, I think that we're going to have that's going to require a lot of very hard choices just with respect to population, like who get you know who is going to have the means to provide for their families or whatever because we're not gonna be able to provide enough food, just as like a very basic thing like that. And so I think we do fundamentally need some capitalist structures in place to be able to just preserve the people that are alive today. I hear I you. I said a lot, I said a lot. I um, and I would say that I, I, I just, I'm sorry, I speak my mind. I fundamentally disagree with everything you just said. That, that's so, that's I'll, totally I'll, fine. I'll just, I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, that where I would see the easiest problem to address is that I can agree that, you know, Marsh isn't designed to be like the solution to feeding the, the world. Um, I do not think that that automatically assumes that capitalism is the only other choice. So I think what we're looking at, you know, we, we talk about ourselves as a social arts laboratory. So we're starting at the very basics of, you know, what does it take for people to produce food for themselves? And what would we need to know about that in order to create systems that work for mutual benefit? I will go back, sorry, to the beginning of this talk, which is that capitalism is intrinsically unethical. And you can argue that it's efficient. You can argue that it's productive. I don't think you can argue that the world has advanced and progressed because of capitalism. It hap capitalism made that happen. Do we think we're better now than what some other system might have been that it would have been less extractive and less exploitive? I don't think we could possibly say that. And so I would not give capitalism the credit for what I consider to be advancements or progress in society. I think that we're as bad off as we've ever been and capitalism got us here. So just to go in a different direction, you know, with that starting with the same, at the same place, can we live the way we did in 1850? Probably to feed the, you know, the billions of people on the planet, probably not. Uh, but is there something other than capitalism that would allow the planet to still exist for us 50 years from now? I got to believe there is, or I would not have children, I would not have grandchildren. You know, I have to believe that there is, and I think that the number one first thing we have to do is scuttle capitalism. No profit, no competition, no bad faith, no growth. Scuttle it, and then figure out what happens next. And, I, and I'm not saying, you know, anarchy. I might be saying anarchy, um, probably not. But, um, and I think that I, you started out talking about that the government has, you know, like socialist programs or whatever. Um, you know, government has, <laughs> is a public service organization. And so they're designed to, um, you know, create a net, We've talked about this, you know, safety net, um, to provide services, to do things that, you know, are best decided by governments. Everybody's gonna disagree what those things are. We have some pretty standard things that we kind of agree on. We sort of agree, agree like maybe on the fire department. We really don't agree on anything else besides that. Um, but that the role of government then is a related but not exactly the same issue. Um, I don't think that the, Uni the United States, you're right, is not necessarily a good example. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of I'm forgetting what my point is that the, I think that the last 
years since since Reagan. Sorry, I don't want to turn this into a political conversation, but I, I think basically that we have become more and more neoliberal, much and much more and more market-based. We have become, the government has become so capitalistic that it's basically no longer functioning. So I think that that, that conflation is the worst thing that ever happened to us, is for our government and capitalism to be operating in mutual conversation. Um, I just have a question. I remember many years ago, I read a book, and I can't remember the name of it, but basically it was talking about comparing the United States to Japan and how Japan had, had traditions and it's a, kind of, the, if you want to say, the same kind of culture throughout Japan. And I was wondering, you know, you look at the Scandinavian countries, they're kind, you know, they're a group of people that are basically the same, maybe not so much recently, but they're still kind of the same type of ideas, culture, whereas they argue that the United States would never be that because we're too much of a melting pot. And I was wondering if you thought maybe that was one reason why the Scandinavian countries tend to have a happier index than we, let's say, in the United States. Yeah, yeah. On that. It, it's, I have seen the argument that you're describing, that that sort of consistency of culture or, or lack of diversity uh, makes, you know, shared decisions a lot easier. Um, that probably is true. I, I think that this is an extremely complex philosophical conversation that I don't know enough about, really, to, to say too much. Um, I will say that something I saw recently um, sort of providing some perspective was that if you were given a map of the United States and told, you know, to put your finger down or whatever, you have a more than 80% chance of hitting a place where no one lives. And that sense of our own, I, I think this influences our feelings about what freedom means. It, it means like that we, we have the expansive um, right to take everything and do everything and be everywhere. And I really think that there's like some kind of like a, a, an Americanism going on in there, you know, starting with manifest destiny and all these kinds of ideas. And I just really think it's, it's a lot different to live on an island in the Pacific or to, you know, live on a peninsula in the North Atlantic than it is to live in a country that is so massively huge um, and, and then the constant contradictions, you know, when people do actually run into each other and what it means for land use and, and those sorts of things. So th to me, that was just, again, it's an image that sticks with me and helps me to understand um, in some ways, you know, we're not a melting pot. We're not pluralistic in any way at all. Um, we're a bunch of little segregated bubbles. Um, and I think part of it is because there is so much land here. Uh, our stream is going to expire at about 90 seconds, but I wanted to open it up in the room if there was a, a burning question anyone had. Otherwise, I found uh, Marsh online while you were talking at uh, marshlife-art.org. Yes. Does that sound correct, .org? That's us. Okay, perfect. Because I know somebody was asking earlier about where to find you guys. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I didn't No, of that. course. And uh, any other ways people can follow up or get involved? Um, the main way is to sign up for our newsletter. Um, we don't presently have a way of doing that online. Um, people can just send us an email um, at, that's available through the website. It's actually bioculturalist um, at Gmail. And I don't know how I can get information to the people here, but you can just send us an email if you'd like to be on our newsletter, and then we'll have um, constant events going on through 2023 um, with this climate project. And um, the store is open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 6. So you can also just sign up for our newsletter by stopping by the store. Yeah, just the question was uh, to expand Marsh into other segments of the city. Uh, we're just getting ourselves right now um and i don't think that we as an enterprise would expand we would hope that somebody else would pick up the idea and start their own co-op yeah yeah great 
Great. Well, everybody, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to everyone on Alter, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you again.